Welcome back everyone to another Downward Day. Now it's been several weeks since I recorded a diary entry for you guys because I was wrapping up the new main channel video which I'm assuming if you're subbed to this channel then you've seen that. Now I think in the Downward Diary entry after this I'm actually going to record a bit of a director's commentary on the video I just released on the main channel. But first I have to discuss a little incident that occurred while that video was in production. So October, as many of you know, is the season of fright, the season of feeling scared. And what better time than for you two to give me yet another classic scare. And over the years of making videos for YouTube, there are a few things that I now find more terrifying than having that email pop up in your inbox with the subject line mentioning YouTube community guidelines. As soon as I see those notifications pop up on my phone, I have an instant spike of anxiety because I immediately know that I now have to go through the horror show of dealing with YouTube's automated systems. I've been to a few haunted houses in my life and while they may be a bit more scary, they are certainly not as aggravating and stress-inducing as going through YouTube's version of the haunted house. Because man, I was complaining about this stuff five years ago. And suffice to say, very little has actually changed. So my video, The Everest Discrepancy, got age-restricted. Didn't really see any reason for it. I mean, it was an educational documentary video that treats the subject with respect. The subject matter itself is not even that gruesome. It's about a man who died from exposure to the elements a hundred years ago. It certainly doesn't fall under the purview of controversial recent events or violence or horror or gore or anything like that. I will admit there's one section of the video that does contain a blurred corpse and after the Logan Paul 2018 incident I don't really think YouTube cares for that that much, but hey, the video was up monetized on YouTube for over a year. Usually when YouTube detects something of that nature, they let you know immediately out of the gates. And this video was confirmed advertiser friendly for pretty much 11 months at this point. So even if this specific part of the video was found to be at fault, it would still be pretty unfair to me to have this system where you supposedly review it out of the gates just to come back 11 months later and retroactively say, oh no, that's actually not true anymore. And this whole theme of retroactive punishment on YouTube is a whole can of worms that I have to get into at a different time. But for the specific circumstance of my video, it was pretty obvious to me that the system had made a mistake. Now, coincidentally enough, a fellow YouTuber who I often get compared to, Summoning Salt, very recently had to deal with an age restriction problem of his own. You see, he posted a video about the history of the Mega Man 2 speedrunning world record. And I guess in the video there was uh, several scenes of the streamers or whatever cursing. Just a little bit of profanity sprinkled in throughout the hour long runtime. And apparently that was enough to get the entire video nuked. And age restricted and that led to a big stink online against YouTube rightfully so I mean you have all these stupid ass podcasts where they spend 30 minutes trying to sell you me undies instead of giving you actual content where they drop the f-bomb 59 times in an hour and those videos seem to be fine but this random documentary about Mega Man 2 that's suddenly where YouTube draws the line just very inconsistent nitpicky and sort of just strange almost like bullying bullying creators who don't fit in to the mold of what YouTube wants people to be. And I think I should reiterate here how crippling age restriction actually is for the channel. Now this is not explicitly proven, but it's strongly believed that when you get a video age restricted on YouTube, that puts your channel in sort of a low priority queue where your successive videos, even if they have nothing wrong with them in the guidelines, even if they get marked as advertiser friendly, it's strongly believed that those future videos will perform more poorly 
after an age restriction than if the age restriction had not been applied. And for creators like Summoning Salt and myself, who don't exactly upload very frequently, that's a big deal. That's a big potential cascading problem in the future, and it becomes especially frustrating when the source of the age restriction to begin with is completely unfounded, where there was seemingly no reason why the age restriction should have been applied in the first place. So with that being said, it's imperative that if you find yourself with an age restriction, that you get it removed and resolved, and you try as hard as you can in YouTube's appeal system to get the age restriction taken off. Because the consensus among YouTubers who've dealt with it is that it basically just acts like a cancer on your channel that sucks the life out of any future projects you may hold for an indefinite amount of time. So you as the creator have to do whatever is in your power to get rid of it, or else suffer untold consequences. But hey, the slight problem with trying to do that is that YouTube's appeal system doesn't exactly work very well. Let's just say that when you go to appeal a video through YouTube's internal systems, the odds are not exactly in your favor. And this is a problem you'll find with many of the modern big tag Silicon Valley platforms, where the support systems on pretty much all these sites are designed to be as circular and unhelpful as possible when you actually have a problem. And anyone who's had to deal with a problem on any social media account can relate to this. But it seems like on every one of these big tech sites, the entire system is designed to funnel you into a generic help page that doesn't actually address your problem whatsoever. And hey, if you don't like generic help pages that are completely irrelevant to your specific problem, maybe you'll like chatting with some AI bot that will listen to you for three sentences and then link you the same generic help page that you just found completely useless. And basically that whole shtick is YouTube's MO. Automated AI systems and generic help pages that don't solve your problem. And I understand why they do it business-wise. There's an incalculable amount of content which probably leads to so many appeals that it's beyond the scope of human ability to actually fix them. With that being said, it's still quite dishonest, in my opinion, how the site basically tries to portray its appeals process as being anything related to a fair, impartial human review, when it's clearly not. It's clearly an AI or a bot or an automated checks and balance system that they just have running behind the scenes. Because knowing other YouTubers who've been age restricted and have tried to resolve it through YouTube's internal system, I cannot recall a single time when the appeal was actually successful. I think for pretty much every single case, the appeal gets instantly rejected in like a matter of minutes, way shorter than the amount of time for a supposed human to actually watch the video. And I mean, it makes sense why the appeals would never be successful when you have in mind that it's conducted by pretty much the same automated system that age restricted the video in the first place. So why would it come out with a different result? So suffice to say, basically, YouTube's internal tools for solving any appeals problem are completely useless. The chance of your appeal actually succeeding through the automated system seems infinitesimally small. So much so where, I must reiterate, I haven't actually heard it work a single time. It seriously has to be like a 99.99% rejection rate, which in practice makes it completely useless as a means of actually reversing the decision, reversing the age restriction that's going to mess up your videos down the line. Now, supposedly, when your channel reaches a certain level of success like mine, you're supposed to be assigned what's called a YouTube Partner Manager. And this, again, is a protocol which a lot of YouTubers I've talked to have had to deal with, but no one really understands what exactly it's for. So theoretically, what these people are supposed to do is help serve as more of a direct line of communication to resolve problems with your channel as well as, I guess, act as a bit of a resource for tips and tricks with how to progress your career and dealing 
with growing on YouTube, when all this time you could have just been watching Downward Diary and probably gotten a better sense of what to do. But I digress. Really the main purpose for any of them is to help you with problems like this. And I've known YouTubers who actually did receive help from their partner manager, but I've also heard an equal number of stories when the partner manager has been completely unhelpful in solving the problem. Obviously, it's better odds than the near zero you have of dealing with YouTube's own internal systems, but it's still not exactly a vote of confidence when I've heard so many other creators who have these guys who have been completely unable to actually resolve their problems, but it's not exactly a vote of confidence based on how many YouTubers I've heard who were able to get no help from the partner manager. Now, I've actually had several partner managers over the years. It's quite strange how they administer it. Now the first manager I had was back in 2018. I did a series of video calls with them where we went through sort of this step-by-step -step process and they helped me unlock several bonus features on my channel. I remember it being quite pleasant. They were kind and courteous and they did actually help me directly with several problems with my channel and the state of the YouTube channel that I was dealing with at the time it certainly felt like a valuable connection to have. The only problem is that after six months, they basically said, we've reached the end of our time and I have to go to someone else now. And I think this is a practice that's continued to this day where the YouTube partner manager is just in this temporary timeshare where you only have them for six months and then they go away, never to be seen again. You can't contact them anymore and you have to just sit and wait for when YouTube randomly decides to assign you another one. So as I said, it's a very strangely administered system. It's almost like, why go through the trouble of constantly introducing new people and having to rebuild that trust with entirely different people when it seems like you could just stick with one person and that would be a lot more of an efficient use of the time and help build these stronger, more long-term relationships between YouTubers and these intermediaries. But no, you get them for six months and then never see them again. So I think in the time after that first channel manager, I've been assigned two other ones, neither of which I think I ever ended up speaking a single word to. At the end of 2021, I think I got an email from one saying that they were newly assigned to me. But unlike the original one I had, they never ended up scheduling any sort of voice call. And over the duration I had them, I never ended up having any problems with my channel that would warrant me actually reaching out to them. So their whole tenure came and went without me ever speaking to them. And what gets even weirder after that is that apparently I was assigned some other guy after that at the beginning of this year. And literally the first email I actually saw from them was them announcing that their time was up and that they were leaving. Apparently this random dude was my partner manager and I was never even notified about it. There was no introductory email. Maybe if there was one, it got sent to junk or something. Whatever the cause, I didn't see it. And guess what? You're going to love this part. That was one week before my video on Mount Everest got age restricted and I actually needed a YouTube contact. The dude abandoned me without ever once telling me he was even assigned to me in the first place right before I actually had a problem and I needed his help. And I tried emailing him after the fact, but once they leave you, they literally cease all forms of communication like you never even existed. Again, let me reiterate, what is YouTube doing with this system? How is this supposed to be helpful? Where you have these guys that are supposedly assigned to you, they don't even tell you, and then after they abandon you, you're just up shit creek once again. It's just completely preposterous and the sort of thing that can only happen in this 21st century dystopian Silicon Valley society. But anyway, to review, YouTube's internal system, completely useless. YouTube's partner manager, inaccessible to most creators on YouTube. And when you actually manage to get one, extremely hit or miss on whether they can be any sort of help. So if you wanna actually appeal a bad decision from YouTube, you have one option and one option only and that's to go to Twitter and complain to the Team YouTube Twitter account. That is literally your best shot of actually getting an incorrect TOS decision reversed. And in the recent history of my channel, this is what I've had to resort to, and I've ended up being successful at it. 
way more successful than anything that's ever come from YouTube's internal systems, from the YouTube Partner Manager. The bitching on Twitter method is literally your most successful shot at actually getting anything done when a bad decision has been applied to your channel. And as I just alluded to, my track record with actually getting appeals overturned in recent history has been quite good. My video on The Thing got taken down and I complained on Twitter and it ended up bringing it back. Last summer, my entire channel got demonetized. I went to go complain on Twitter and my monetization was reinstated in 48 hours. Look, the thing is, I don't play it that fast and loose on YouTube anymore. My content generally tends to fall in the guidelines. So when I get these community guidelines strikes or age restriction or whatever, it's almost always unwarranted. So you're damn right I should be winning these appeals because it's the correct decision to make. I've accumulated so much personal experience with interacting with the Team YouTube Twitter account. And over all this time, I've actually developed a skill, an art, if you will, of talking to the Team YouTube Twitter account and pleading my case. So thus far, what I've learned you have to do to improve your chances of a successful appeal is as follows. Now, first of all, you're going to be pissed off and irate because you just got a video unfairly taken down or age restricted or whatever. So before you go to Twitter, you're going to have to suck it up. You're going to have to act professional, hold back all the anger and rage you may be experiencing, and just tweet out your problem in a neutral, non-emotional, informational way. You just simply state the nature of your problem, the video it's affecting, and why you think it's wrong. You don't go in acting all indignant, hateful, and cantankerous and throwing insults at YouTube or Susan or whatever. Just simply state the problem and why you think YouTube made a mistake. You tag Team YouTube right out at Team YouTube in the tweet. And if they don't respond in about 24 hours, then you restate your problem again, tag them again in the form of a question, and they almost always respond. This is the process it takes to actually initiate a real manual review with a human where they can actually go in and get results. Now what they decide in this part of the appeals process, that's pretty much going to be the end of it. You're not really going to have any options after that. So after this point, what they say goes. But the important part for you is actually getting to that stage of the process where you actually have a chance for your video to be seen by a human and to actually have your appeal have a fair chance at being overturned. And in many cases like mine, where the age restriction or community guidelines enforcement is a false positive, in my experience, it tends to actually get overturned and your video can go back to normal and you don't have to worry about your channel getting throttled in the future. I really wish there was a better way, but this is honestly the best chance you got. If you have a problem on YouTube, you have to use the Team YouTube Twitter account as a mediator to actually initiate a fair review. And so in this very specific circumstance, when I went to the Team YouTube account to plead my case for the Everest video, they initially rejected my claim. But they did so in a way that allowed me to argue my case further because they told me that my video would remain age restricted because it supposedly contained violence. Now obviously I made the video, I know that's not the case. In the video there are descriptions of people dying to natural causes and exposure to the elements. It has nothing to do with violence. So not satisfied with their decision, I ended up responding to the tweet and so I asked them this very simple question of what part of the video specifically was flagged for violence. And then a couple hours later, they got back to me saying that they couldn't find any and that they had made a mistake. The system had made an oversight and the age restriction got successfully overturned. So I guess the moral of the story here is don't be afraid to push YouTube on the logic of their decisions. You know, they make mistakes. The administration of the system is often sloppy. But the review team is not these bunch of evil, mega maniacal people who want you to fail. At the end of the day, YouTube wants the same thing as you. They want the video to go out there and make you and them some money. At the end of the day, the community guidelines are there to appease the advertisers and the government and whatever, to stop them from throwing a hissy fit over inappropriate content and suing YouTube. The bottom line is that YouTube would prefer that your videos are public and earning them revenue. 
The appeal system in its current state still has a long way to go, but at the very least, you as a creator have a means, you have a lifeline of helping to reverse these decisions when they are clearly wrong and that the system has clearly made a mistake. This is not a guarantee of success by any means. Oftentimes, YouTube simply can't be reasoned with. But at the very least, you can't be afraid to try to plead your case. A lot of people and creators are really blackpilled towards YouTube's aptitude to actually solve creator problems right now. Look no further than the replies to whenever any YouTuber is in a dispute with Team YouTube. I guess my advice to all of you out there who have to deal with a similar problem to mine, just keep your head down, swallow your pride, be polite, be courteous, stick to the facts, stick to the logic of the situation, and who knows, you might be surprised at how things can end up working out for you in the end.